Good morning and good afternoon. My name is John Herbst. I run the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council. We have a wonderful event for you um, today on the Russian Duma elections. Um, we have an absolutely marvelous panel. We have um, Vladimir Karamurza, a leading Russian opposition, truly opposition politician. We have Dr. Maria Snegovai, a postdoctoral fellow in political science at Virginia Tech University, and a Renan resident senior fellow at the Eurasia Center of the Atlantic Council. We have Tatiana Usmanova, who's the campaign manager for Duma candidate Andrei Pulavada. And we have Brian Whitmore, who's a non-resident senior fellow at the Eurasia Center, yeah, but also a adjunct assistant professor at the University of Texas in Arlington. So I'd like to thank you for joining us. I'd like to thank our panel for being with us. And I'd like to start with um, Brian. Brian, what were the big takeaways from the elections? The charges of fraud by the opposition parties, and what were there any surprises? Um, there, there weren't really any big surprises. This is one of these strange, th and thank you, John, for hosting this event. Thank you for having me. Um, this is one of these strange elections where I wasn't quite sure what to expect going in. And we we're going into it with the, we knew we knew the Kremlin can fix an election, and they showed us that they can, again, fix an election. The the, the reports of, of fraud were widespread and well-documented, but we've come to expect this from Russian elections. Um, the thing I was watching for is what I always watch for in a Russian election is Russian elections aren't elections in the way we think of elections. Russian elections are political theater. How'd the theater go? It didn't go that well, I don't think. Um, um, but on the other hand, smart voting as a tactic, and I'd be really curious to hear what Vladimir and Maria think of this. I'm wondering if smart voting as a tactic has not reached its limits um, because this effort to, to, to do smart voting, the Kremlin was successful in shutting it down, it, it appears. But why don't you explain for our audience what smart voting is? Smart voting is a tactic that the, that the opposition wanted to bring into the election. Um, it was pioneered, as far as I understand, by, by Alexei Navalny. And the idea is that in each district, you vote for a candidate, one candidate, who can, has the best chance of defeating the United Russia candidate. And this is kind of determined uh, by, by the Navalny organization, and they created an app. Uh, where which would which would uh, direct voters in every every one of Russia's districts which candidate in that district has the best chance of defeating the United Russia candidates, um, and the the authorities were were apparently I still want to see more data but were apparently were able to shut this down. Um, they pressured Google and Apple to take it off their app stores, which I'm very disappointed to say they did. Um, and and I don't know the effect that had. I'd be again, Vladimir is on the ground there in Moscow. I'd be really curious to hear what what he thinks about this. But a couple other things that jumped out at me: turnout was low; it was only forty five percent. And one of the main things in these elections is the the mobilization factor. And if they could only turn out forty five percent, that 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 also uh, says a lot. So I don't I don't think this uh, the signs are very good for the regime coming out of this election. Now, what that means going forward is another question, but I don't I, I don't see this, this, this election as a success in the terms of political theater. Although we do know that, yeah, the Kremlin can still fix an election, but we knew that going in. Okay, thank you. Um, Tichana, you ran the campaign for Andrei Pivovarov even as he was in jail. Um, how did he do? Um, and how did you run a Russian Duma campaign, much less one for a jail candidate? Hi. Uh, first, I want to say a few words about Andre. Um, uh, Andre, uh, human rights defenders recognized Andre uh, Andre's persecution as politically motivated. Uh, Andre is jailed for the participation in undesirable organization, Open Russia. How they call Open Russia the uh, the undesirable organization. So uh, that's why he is now uh, in jail. Uh, running uh, the campaign for the jail candidate was uh, really hard. You know, yesterday uh, I understood that I uh, I wasn't I had only one chance to see my candidate. It was uh, yesterday uh, when I was uh, as an observer in the jail where he is now. Uh, and all the time we had only the one option to communicate. It's uh, through the letters. Uh, it was a really unique campaign uh, with uh, three headquarters in three Russian cities in Krasnodar, where Andrei is sued in his hometown, St. Petersburg, and of course in Moscow. 
Uh, we were uh, we had a lot of advertisement on the streets. We signed uh, about about uh, three thousand people uh, signed the petition for his freedom, and we sent about uh, one or two thousand postcards, which uh, people uh, sign uh, which people wrote him on the streets. Uh, unfortunately, Andre didn't win. But honestly, it was not possible for him to win uh, from the beginning. Uh, he was um, he was nominated uh, by Yablaka party in the Krasnodar. It's not his hometown. Of course, he is not. Uh, honestly, he is not popular in this uh, in this city, and uh, the party had to be uh, about thirty percent to enter the parliament. Uh, so it didn't happen in Russia this time, and uh, if you check the results, you know that uh, nobody win these uh, elections. We had no really independent candidates in this state Zuma. Uh, but uh, anyway, I think it was a great chance for Andre and for our team to show the government that Andre is uh, he is in prison, but he is one of the most uh, free person in this country, and uh, he wants to even in jail. He wants to take part in the campaign in the political life of Russia. Tatiana, thank you, and certainly uh, we we grieve for him in, in jail. It's outrageous. Okay, Maria. What do these elections tell us about where the Russian electorate is? Uh, John, can I start that by politely disagreeing with Brian said? Please. <laughs> yes, please. I actually, uh, I respect Brian and love Brian deeply, but I want to say that for me, uh, and I watch uh, every single Russian election, uh, there were a lot of surprises. Uh, most of them not good ones, but this is unusual, unlike uh, most other elections we've seen before. Uh, the Kremlin would not have won, and that's actually pretty clear, even through conventional falsification and fraudulent method. We've seen unprecedented level of impersonal, uh, like balance, uh, falsification falsifications like ballot stuffing and whatnot but uh, it's very clear from the results that appeared from the offline uh, voting that the United Russia was not going to get the majority and it was losing pretty bad especially in Moscow and St. Petersburg where smart voting actually delivered victory I, again judging only from the offline uh, results uh, for um, in each district old age district in St. Peter maybe Tatiana will correct me if I'm wrong and the 12 out of 13 districts in Moscow it's only through the electronic voting, which was completely faked uh, because it is not absolutely untestable at this point and brings the result in extremely high results and extremely high advantage to the United Russia uh, party. It's only through the electronic voting that the authorities have been able to do it this time. It's a new innovative type of fraud because the older types of fraud do not vote anymore. Uh, and the second thing that's new is that we are potentially facing the poll for the first time in 16 years, 16. We are facing the party, a parliament with five parties, potentially. That's again until the uh, votes have been counted. The new party that's entering, it's new, uh, new people. Uh, party, of course, still a systemic party, so you're not really talking about it as an opposition, but it's supposed to be cutting out the Navalny electorate. So what does it tell us about the Russian people? To go back to your uh, question, John, Russian people are very unhappy about the current status quo, and not just conventional, like liberal opposition types who are always unhappy, <laughs> uh, but also the uh, increasingly the conventional electorate who were usually Putin supporters or fairly satisfied with the way things are. Um, but then uh, the United Russia or Putin, they are no longer able to win. Even these people, uh, even as I said, with the con con while maintaining the conventional falsification uh, methods as before. So they're now coming up with more sophisticated, uh, more um, digital types of uh, fraud. And that's the new challenge that the opposition will have to face uh, in the future. Overall, I think that the Kremlin is unlikely to be very satisfied with the results of this election. Uh, the the Results have shown that there is a lot of disappointment and they have to come up with very blatant fraudulent methods to, to maintain the popular, uh, the, the same um, uh, votes um, as before. Thank you. Um, Vlad, uh, given the outcome of the elections, what's the strategy of the opposition going forward? What needs to happen between now and the 2024 presidential election? Well, John, thank you so much, first of all, for hosting our conversation uh, on this important topic. And I 
Well, I'll, I'll also apologize for being in a car, but with with Moscow traffic, the best laid plans of mice and men gang on and glee. So I thought it's best just to park on the side of the street because I wanted to make sure to be able to join this conversation. Uh, just a note about the uh, the election itself. Uh, I mean, I think discussing the the figures, the numbers, the the, the parties is about as serious as uh, discussing you know elections in the Islamic Republic of Iran or, or remembering those old one party elections in the Soviet Union where they would announce that. Uh, the, uh, the the block of communist and non-party members would receive 99.9 percent in the 12 non-Baltic Soviet republics, but 97.5 percent in the three Baltic republics, because of course there the protest sentiments were high. It's about as serious to discuss the, these figures. Uh, one important point is, first of all, uh, Maria uh, was was absolutely right in 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 terms of this new electronic uh, so-called electronic voting being the main instrument of fraud this time, uh, because, uh, you know, they used to have to make some efforts to falsify election results. They used to have to bust people around and falsify protocols and do ballot stuffing. By the way, all of, all of these things happened too, uh, this time as they did previously. But in the end, they didn't need that much because they could just literally make up millions of votes electronically that nobody can verify or check in any way. And just as an interesting uh, sort of uh, insight, I was... Um, I spent last night um, monitoring the vote count at my own polling place uh, where I live in Zamaskarecha in, in downtown Moscow, uh, which is which is really central. And one of the uh, sort of features of, of my polling station is that for years it has reported honest results. Uh, so I guess it's, I mean, it's, they don't want to falsify 10 minute walk from the Kremlin, uh, literally in the middle of Moscow. So for example, Alexei Navalny officially uh, won the Moscow mayor election in 2013 at my polling place, it's polling place number 40 on Bashar Dinka Street in Moscow. And so I spent last night um, watching the vote count and then when the results were announced, I still have the copy of the official protocol in my pocket, uh, just to give our viewers an idea of what an actual honest vote count, I don't mean an honest election because for an honest election, you actually need to have access by opposition politicians to the ballot, which in most cases is forbidden in Russia today. But even in the current conditions, what an honest vote count would produce. I saw that, I have a copy of it in my pocket. So the three top parties, according to the official figures uh, from my polling places back in downtown Moscow, 27% for the Communist Party, and this is no doubt, to your question to Brian, this is no doubt uh, an effect of the so-called smart vote initiative by Navalny supporters, so 27% for the Communists, 20% uh, for United Russia, the party of Vladimir Putin, and 19% for Yabloko, the only genuine opposition party that dares to systematically criticize both the domestic and the foreign policies of the Putin regime was allowed to run in this election that was also compulsorily labeled by the regime as, quote, affiliated with a foreign agent, end of quote. The foreign agent, quote unquote, being Andrei Pivovarov from Tatiana just represented the only political prisoner to be a candidate in this election. And on the district side, Sergei Mitrokhin, who's one of the leaders of Yablaka, also backed by the Smart Vote Initiative, received 35% against 14% by the pro-regime candidate Oleg Leonov. So these are the real vote counting results, even in the current repressive authoritarian conditions. And then you see the official figures that were produced by this so-called electronic voting. But um, John, when you ask about the strategy, you know, our strategy as the opposition here, uh, it doesn't depend in any way on these so-called fake elections or this political theater, as Brian puts it, that the regime feels the need to go through this motion every uh, five or six years, depending parliamentary or presidential. We know uh, that political change in Russia is not going to come through the ballot box just because it, that's not allowed, that's not possible. The regime has done everything it can to make sure that that cannot happen. Uh, and, you know, ostensibly, uh, everything that the Kremlin does to repress the opposition, and this is what Putin said again at a recent press conference when um, Angela Merkel, the outgoing German chancellor, came here to Moscow and they had a press conference with Putin and she once again called for the release of Alexei Navalny from prison. And, and Putin said, uh, of course, that no, it's not going to happen, but he also explained it as he thinks by saying that Russia has had enough revolutions. This is sort of his, uh, his own uh, reasoning for repressing the opposition. Well, I'm, I'm, you know, I have a surprise for him. You know, I'm a historian by education myself, and the, the incontrovertible law of history is that in those countries where governments cannot be changed through the ballot box, they will sooner or later be changed on the streets. And so if there's anybody today who is laying the ground for future political upheavals in this country, it is those folks who are sitting behind the Kremlin walls. And they show this uh, blindsidedness again uh, with the sort of the sledgehammer way that they falsified the so-called election uh, over the last three days.
Go ahead. Um, a quick follow up, uh, because it's actually a question from Dan Freed in the chat. Can you explain how they've used the electronic system to falsify? The, Dan, thank you so much for the question. The honest answer is nobody knows because nobody knows how the system functions. I'll give you just one fact. Normally, I mean, many countries use, many democratic countries use electronic voting. Uh, a lot of countries in Europe. Uh, and, and, you know, the way this usually happens, of course, as soon as the election is over, as soon as the, you know, the voting day is over, you get results almost instantly, right? Because obviously you don't need to count anything physically. You just press a button and the results come out. So we are now, what is it? It's quarter past 4 p.m. Uh, here in Moscow. Uh, election ended at 8 p.m. last night on Sunday. We still do not have the full official results of the electronic voting. The paper ballots have been counted. We know the results of the elections where people had to spend the whole night, and I was there again watching it myself last night at the polling station, where people had to physically count the ballots, then tally the protocols, then take it to the uh, to the you know district electoral commissions to be tabulated, to be published online. We have those results. We still do not have the results of a system where normally you just need to press a button and you see the results. Because the reason for that is that they are looking to see how many votes they have to falsify in favor of which candidate in which district to make sure that the United Russia guys win. Because uh, as Maria has said, if we only take the results, Lev Schlossberg, the Yablico candidate, who was taken off the ballot last week by the Supreme Court uh, decision, who would have definitely won the election if he was running in the west of Moscow uh, in a district for the State Duma. But he said it brilliantly, I think, yesterday. He said, if we look at those results, it will be like two different countries. If you look at the results of the actual paper ballots when people walked with their feet and voted, and you see the results, which we don't know yet in Moscow, but we do know for other regions, because uh, there are several regions in Russia uh, where, where this system has been used, they have nothing to do with each other. And this is just not statistically possible. It's like they come from different planets. And so this so-called so e-voting, nobody knows how it works. Nobody knows how it's tabulated. There's no way to control it. There's no way to observe it. So they just, basically, they can just write any results they want. And this is sort of the, uh, the the brilliance of it. I mean, I don't want to use that word from their point of view, that they don't need to go through all these violations that, that people see all over the world. They can just write what they want. And I'm absolutely certain that after this so-called election, electronic voting will be uh, will become a nationwide system. Because for now, it's only limited to, I think, seven or eight regions in Russia. Uh, just like last year during this fake constitutional plebiscite, they tried multiple day vote, where they had several nights to change the ballots. So now we have three day vote two nights to change the balance and also i'm certain that next time uh we'll see nationwide electronic voting with unlimited resources for the regime uh to write whatever result they want but again it's important to remember that those official results have little or nothing to do with the actual reality with the actual sentiments of the russian public and again the law of history in those countries where you cannot change the government through the ballot box sooner or later it will be changed in the streets and i fear that is the shape uh, that awaits us here in russia okay uh, well thank you Tatiana, I'd like to ask you the same question I asked Vladimir. Um, where, you know, again, after the election, what does the opposition do next? What, what does the future look like? Uh, you know, I have the same uh, worries about the electronic votes, and I read just one hour ago that uh, uh, our politicians, they, they told us that electronic is our future, and of course, next, uh, next elections, uh, in all regions, we will have this uh, this possibility, and uh, people for young people, they say it's the best uh, it's the best option for the young people because it's easier for them to vote through the computer, through the laptop and mobile phone. So uh, you can see we are so digital, we are so great. Please, uh, please say thank you for us, and it's terrible for sure. Uh, when we talk about the future. I think, you know, uh, a lot of uh, politicians now they're abroad, they're not in Russia. Uh, uh, I'm happy to see Vladimir in Moscow, and I'm also in the country, but not this summer changed everything. And uh, hundreds of people, they moved uh, to, to Europe, they moved to, to Georgia or to, to some other countries. And uh, I think that now everything, not everything, but uh, a lot of activities will be in digital. Uh, first, YouTube. Now it's uh, 
uh, for, for the moment, we have YouTube in Russia, you know, that uh, we have the, maybe it will be closed or maybe it will work slower in the future. And Histo Grozev um, uh, wrote a, a, a very um, brilliant article about it, that uh, for his opinion, uh, for during the next uh, year or two years, YouTube will almost almost won't work here but anyway for the moment we do have it so i think um, we will have a lot of activities in digital uh yesterday we had a uh, few uh youtube shows uh discussing where politicians were discussing the results of the campaign and uh, thousands of people were watching it and i think for the next year, it will be the main uh, possibility to show your opinion only on digital, not on the streets. Thank you. Okay, um, Brian, um, you said um, you, you have a long-term watcher of Russia. You said Russian elections are important as a legitimizing activity. Did the Kremlin get the legitimacy out of this election that it wanted? And did the opposition get anything at all real that you think is important? Yeah, thank you for that question. That's a good question, John. I mean, I think my initial reaction is no, they did not get the legitimization they required out of this election. Um, but I, 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 would I would add the caveat that this is fluid right now, and I'm watching as much what happened in the so-called election to the post-election narrative about the election and how that resonates within Russian society. When I said I was not, I didn't see any surprises, and I think Maria and I agree more than we disagree here. Um, going in, my only question was how brazen are they going to be about falsification? Are they gonna falsify it to just a bare majority, which is what they ended up doing, or are they gonna to try to falsify it with a little bit, uh, with, with a larger majority or even perhaps a constitutional majority? And I think they probably made a decision about what, this, uh, what, what, uh, what, what society would tolerate on that. Um, but I think it's very telling. I mean, you know, Joseph Stalin said it's not important how they vote, it's important how we count. Um, and the only thing that's really changed is, yes, with this online voting, the, the, the opportunities for digital fraud are enormous. They can create whatever result they want out of that. Um, without even really resorting to the ballot stuffing that we saw on, on, on all those videos and the carousel voting and the busting and so on and so forth. But even with all this, even with all this, they only falsified to a bare majority for United Russia, which I think is, is, is quite telling. And with a 45% turnout. Now, it, in terms of the legitimization of uh, the success or failure of this is a legitimization ritual, the, we have to remember what this is about. This is the first step or the last step before 2024, the last federal event before 2024. And that's what this is all about. In 2024 is when Putin will try to extend his term. Um, as we all know, we had constitutional reforms last year in which uh, Putin's term limits were effectively zeroed out. So he is starting at zero now and can serve two more terms, which means he can serve, serve until 2036, which effectively means he's, he, he's gonna be president for life. So 2024 is the year we determine whether, the, where, where, where Russia will determine whether or not that is going to happen. And going into that step, I and again, I'm very curious to hear what, uh, what, 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 my, what, what my Russian colleagues think about this, because I don't think they got the legitimization they need here. Yeah, they're going to get a Duma where United Russia has a majority and the only parties in are, are host, house broken so-called opposition parties. But we knew that was going to be the case anyway. But in the in the broader sense, and that's what I'm looking looking forward is how does the post-election narrative about the election play now? Um, and, and, and that's going to set the stage for the regime's legitimacy. It does not look good, as Vladimir was pointing out. I mean, if this were a real election, they would have gotten crushed. And I think everybody knows that. So that's so I, I do not think this was a successful legitimization ritual for the regime. Well, it's, it's interesting, too, that early results yesterday and progno prognostications were suggesting that United Russia would do not as well as it has done with the falsification, you know, talking about 40, 45% for United Russia. This is their worst result ever, if I'm not mistaken. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but, but anybody, uh, but I think this is the worst result they've ever had. 
Uh, that, that's consistent with, at this point, years of polling suggesting the majority of Russian single okay. countries going in the right direction. We're wrong direction, the wrong yeah. direction. Okay, Maria, the Levada centers on polling showing that young people in Russia and business class are far less friendly towards Putin and United Russia, and also far more friendly towards the, the West. Is that going to change how the, how the Kremlin tries to keep people in line? Is that a signal that we in the West should be doing more outreach? Absolutely, uh, it definitely has changed how the Kremlin uh, views the threats. As a matter of fact, we have witnessed uh, this latest uh, wave of uh, crackdown on the civil society in Russia, which was unprecedented in scale, completely even by Russia's own uh, levels. Uh, Tatiana has spoken about that. Uh, that uh, the targets of uh, Kremlin's repressions have been shifting uh, somewhat. Uh, first of all, they expanded to pretty much every single uh, group uh, within civil society. Uh, beyond uh, purely political activists and politicians, uh, also attacking journalists, lawyers, uh, even uh, universities. Um, and this is where I think the novelty is, um, because the Kremlin realizes that the new generation is one of the key uh, groups of opposition and the key challenges for the future. The future is really against the Kremlin, so to speak, because all the young groups increasingly uh, become, uh, grow in opposition, become more anti-Kremlin and more supportive of Navalny and other independent, independent opposition uh, forces. So the targets now have become, uh, among other uh, groups, first of all, the universities. Uh, we've seen that uh, even Kudrin's own uh, project, Alexei Kudrin, the long-term associate of Putin, uh, who created his own um, department uh, in collaboration with Bard College. Uh, the Bard College was eventually this summer put on the undesirables list uh, in a somewhat unprecedented uh, development uh, because in the past universities did not get on the undesirables list. Uh, and of course, also the could, um, sorry, Yaroslav Kuzminov, the long-term head of the High School of Economics, was, let's assume, forced to step down. He technically announced this was his own decision, but it was very abrupt and sudden. And that reason is because the High School of Economics is a very liberal university uh, from which in the past many uh, opposition-minded activists have emerged. Um, uh, so this is the first um, uh, takeaway uh, that we've needed. The second one is a crackdown on the internet. And this is a very worrisome development, particularly in light of the news uh, associated with Google and Apple agreeing to take down the smart voting uh, campaign information. Uh, because the Kremlin undoubtedly views uh, the spread of internet is the, one of the key uh, main challenges. As a matter of fact, directly states that in the security, national security doctrine, the newest version uh, which was adopted this summer, it really states that the internet and especially the youth uh, that are susceptible to the digital terrorist influence of internet, uh, the key is one of the key national security threats. So the internet will also be taken under control, unfortunately, and I think the very fact that Apple and Google essentially have demonstrated their willingness to comply with the censorship has really given the Kremlin a green light. And as this election uh, end, we will see many more of these practices spreading into the regular life with the internet being increasingly taken under control by the Russian authorities. Oh, uh, I, 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 I agree with you. It's a disgrace that Google and Apple bowed the Kremlin dictates. Is this something that you think that U.S. Congress uh, should take a look at? I think absolutely that uh, the fact that the tech companies, the U.S. tech companies actually comply with the dictatorship's uh, standards is a big issue. I think it should be debated. I hope there's a legislative solution here, perhaps. I mean, because otherwise, really, we are, we are seeing the end of the Internet as we know it, uh, because it's clearly recognized as a, the key uh, problem by many of the dictatorship. So the key uh, issue for the Kremlin, the monopoly, the information monopoly that used to help it in the past to control society for television, is completely disrupted now with the increasing groups of society uh, use taking my information from the internet. So that is going to be unquestionably the key challenge. And as long as the tech companies comply, uh, the Kremlin will be able to deal with it. I think as long as the, I think this should, the issue that absolutely should be raised by the US Congress discussed and perhaps there might be some legislative incentives available to stop uh, tech companies from complying so willingly uh, with the, the uh, dictatorships um, um, uh, let's, uh, regulation. Okay, thank you. Um, Vlad, <clears throat> Tatiana already noted that some people in the real opposition have left for other places, for Georgia for, or uh, elsewhere in Europe. Um, what does the opposition do now? Um, are there people, I mean, you, you, you're, you're, both of you are in Russia, 
You know, so, we, so now that all opposition is leaving, what, what, what is the strategy? What happens next? First of all, let, let's make it clear that not everybody will leave because for many of us, right. myself included, it's an absolute question of principle to remain in our own country. I don't right. think you can be a politician and not be in the country. It just doesn't work. And I was so right. surprised, frankly, when I was uh, inundated with so many calls from Western journalists back in September last year, a year ago now, when Alexei Navalny woke up from his coma to announce that he's going to go back to Russia as soon as he's able to. And uh, all these journalists started calling me up and, and asking uh, and asked me to comment on this sensation as they put it to which i said that not only don't i see any kind of sensation there's there's not even any news here of course he's going to go back he's a russian politician a russian politician has to be in russia to me there's no question in my mind after both poisonings that as soon as i was physically able to i would after also completing medical rehab abroad as alexei did that i would go back as soon as i was able to and i did and, I, and i'm here now it's a question of principle for many of us so let's let's not sort of create this image that everybody's in. That is not the case. But much more important than those of us who are sort of visible opposition figures, much more important than this, is the fact that there are millions of people in Russia who fundamentally reject uh, Putinism and everything it stands for, both in terms of the domestic repression and in terms of the external aggressiveness. Those two are sort of the hallmarks, the two sides of the same medal when it comes to, uh, uh, to, to the regime of Vladimir Putin. There are millions of people who want Russia to become a normal, modern, democratic, European country. And it's important when we talk about these fake elections and, and, and these sort of made up figures that the authorities are announcing, is it important to always have a reality check that this actually has little or nothing to do with reality. It has about as much to do with reality as my good friend uh, Boris Vishnevsky, who is actually was re-elected last night to, uh, to his seat in the St. Petersburg Legislative Assembly, one of the few uh, genuine opponents of the regime who are still legislators in this country, albeit at a regional level, you know, he he uh, likes to repeat this phrase that Ceausescu in Romania, the communist dictator, had 99% support in official figures at the beginning of December 1989. You know, he didn't say much about what would happen in just a few weeks. So, so let's not lose a sense of reality here. Um, I'm not just a politician, but also a historian. And one thing we do know about the history of Russia is that major political change uh, uh, large-scale political change in this country uh, can happen like this. It can happen suddenly, unexpectedly, including unexpectedly for their own participants. You know, nobody predicted 1905, nobody predicted 1917. We'll just mark the 30th anniversary of our democratic revolution in August 1991. Nobody at the beginning of August 1991 predicted that the Soviet regime would not survive until the end of the month. And that one of the most horrendous and repressive totalitarian regimes in the history of humanity will go down in three days. This is how things can happen in Russia. So to answer your question, John, our main task is to prepare. Our main task is to work with the young generation. And this uh, was actually the focus for, for, for many years, the focus of work of Andrzej Pivovarov, uh, whom, whom Tatiana is representing in our conversation, who's my friend, my colleague, who was head of the Open Russia movement until it was declared, declared undesirable and disbanded. Uh, one, of, one of the sort of main areas of focus is working with the young generation, the new generation of uh, especially regional pro-democracy activists, civil society activists, those young people who reject, and Maria was speaking about this, and there are polling figures and surveys to confirm this, that the young people of Russia, the people who have no other memory except Vladimir Putin because he's been in power for so long, are increasingly rejecting this stagnating authoritarian kleptocracy. And it is working with those people uh, to lay the groundwork for that uh, future change, whenever and however it may come, it will because nothing is forever. And Mr. Putin's regime is not going to be the exception. But our main task now is to prepare and to lay the groundwork for that future political change in Russia, because when change starts happening, it's too late to start preparing. You need to do, you need to act. And so this, this is the main focus. And uh, yes, perhaps some of these things will have to be done abroad. Some of these things will have to be done virtually, as the channel was saying. Uh, but we are certainly not uh, stopping, we're certainly not giving up, many of us are certainly not leaving, and I have absolutely no doubt, again speaking more as a historian than as a politician, that Russia has a democratic future. There is no conceivable reason why, you know, we should be the only country in Europe to, you know, be destined to live under an authoritarian regime. People who say that, in my view, that those views are condescending, they're insulting, and most of all, they are false. It has been said about many countries in Europe that, oh, these countries only can live under authoritarianism. Most of them are 
uh, you know, functioning liberal democracy today. In fact, there are only two dictatorships left in Europe. These are Russia and Belarus. And I have absolutely no, day, uh, no doubt that the day will come when Europe is completely dictatorship free. And everything that we do and, and all of our work is, uh, is aimed at trying to bring that day uh, a little bit closer. Um, that was a brilliant use of history uh, to make your point. Uh, all right, um, I'm gonna ask one more question um, before turning to the audience. And we've, we've talked about smart voting. Uh, my question is, is smart voting now um, obsolete because of the way the Kremlin handled this in this election, because of the bowing by Western tech companies to Kremlin um, diktat, or does smart voting still have a future? So um, Tatiana, I'll start with you and then we'll go down the list on this and then we'll turn to the audience. Oh, you know, it's, uh, it's very difficult to comment uh, smart voting now in uh, uh, now because, uh, uh, you know, it's there. Uh, of course, it's the great instrument. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, it's, uh, mm, it helps thousands of people to find the right candidate. And uh, it's uh, a very good idea to focus only on the most popular candidates, but not on uh, on somebody else. Uh, but you know, it's not there. The of of course, like all like everything, it's not it's not the ideal instrument. And uh, because of their, for my from my point of view, because uh, of their not not right choices, some uh, real independent people didn't win. And uh, I think uh, that uh, some brilliant uh, uh, candidates could become their even state Duma uh, deputies, uh, but smart voting didn't help them. And uh, for this, I'm for, for this, it's it's a very big mistake. Thank you. Vlad, your thoughts. Thank you, John. Well, you know, so far we've been talking about smart vote as a sort of uh, as a tactic, right? That, that's what it is. It is a tactic, and we've been talking about its effectiveness. And uh, you know, I I, I love to uh, sort of cite this example from the Moscow City Duma election in two thousand nineteen right. uh, with a fake Solovyov. You all know the story. There was a there was a real opposition candidate, my good friend, and then Tatiana's as well, Alexander Solovyov, who was running for a seat, or I should say, was planning to run for a seat in Moscow City Duma. He was taken off the ballot. He was jailed. Uh, but there was also another Alexander Solovyov, you know, the classic spoiler tactic. They found somebody with the same name, placed him on the ballot, and I guess they forgot to take him off. Because the guy, you know, didn't appear in a district, he didn't hold a single meeting, he didn't publish a single leaf, he did nothing. Smart vote backed him one week before the election. He won in a landslide against the pro-regime candidate, and the Electoral Commission spent two days trying to locate his phone number to tell him that he's now an elected member of the Moscow City Duma. It's a great story, uh, you know, shows the great effectiveness of this tactic. But I think it's important when we discuss the effectiveness or the tactical side of smart vote. Uh, also, not forget about the moral side, frankly, and the substance, not just the tactic. Because uh, as Tatiana just alluded, for many of us, for many democratically minded people here in Russia, it is inconceivable in any situation, for whatever tactical reasons, to vote, for example, for the Communist Party uh, that, that still glorifies Stalinism, that brings flowers to his grave, that has rejected nothing from its history, you know, the Gulag, the uh, collectivization, everything that they've done. And, and by the way, the party that still, in most cases, supports all of the repressive laws passed by Vladimir Putin's regime. You know, two of my great-grandfathers were murdered under Stalin. My grandfather was in the Gulag. I can never vote for the Communist Party for whatever tactical reasons. And this goes for a lot of people in this country. So let's not forget this about smart vote, that it's unacceptable, completely morally unacceptable for many of us, for whatever reason of, you know, to produce these nice stories, to go and put a cross on a ballot against, you know, a party that glorified Stalin and the Gulag. And this is this is actually, I think, the major problem with Smart Vote Initiative. It's not so much, I'm, I'm glad that there are a lot of mentions of what Google and Apple and YouTube did this week, because it is shameful when Western tech companies, when US tech companies start dancing to the tunes of foreign dictatorships as they did this week. Uh, but let's, when we talk about Smart Vote, let's also not forget about this. And so for many of us, uh, you know, our only option in a so-called election uh, was Yabloka, because it is the only party that actually stands for a for a democratic European alternative for Russia. Not vote for one set of Stalinists to punish another set of Stalinists. 
you know, to, to vote for cholera against black plague, as it were. To me, this is the major problem with the smart vote, which should be discussed, because not everything is about tactics. I, I still think, maybe I'm naive, but I still think there should be some room for principle and substance in politics, not just those, uh, you know, nice looking uh, tactical gestures. Okay, fair enough. I, I think we, we, we've now reached the 20 minute mark. We'll turn to audience questions. Uh, all right, we have a question, let's see, from Mark Keller. Will the election result change the behavior of Putin towards Europe? Uh, Maria, would you like to get, take that? Uh, towards your specific club, sorry? Yes. Will the election results change Putin's policy, his behavior towards Europe? And, okay, so first of all, can I quickly address what's been said before? Uh, there's a correct uh, comment here that it's absolutely true sure. that the uh, United Russia only did not get the, um, uh, only got 49% for I think we just got the uh, final uh, results announced after 99% of um, votes estimated. Uh, it's only it's only for proportional uh, part, uh, 49.84%. But it's also uh, the single member districts uh, from which um, the United Russia get an absolute majority and the result will be about 70% of the parliament again controlled by the United Russia party, most likely. Uh, so this is the two sources of uh, fraud, right? The uh, single member districts and this, uh, the electronic voting. And second, I think the very fact that potentially this fifth part of the new people making it to the parliament is a success partly of the smart voting campaign in the volume, because this is the group that are supposed to mimic, the, to fake the liberal uh, protest opposition vote. These are the business minded people, the, the ones that are pro-European to address the question of uh, asked uh, from the audience, right? And so they sort of felt the need to create uh, this another fake party because the group, as they realized that the large share of society at this point, at least 15, 20 percent of the society, are not represented for this conventional distribution of the four parties. We'll see if they, they end up actually pushing the new people into the parliament, but if they do, I'd say that's the victory in some ways uh, for the uh, Navalny. That essentially created the urge, the need for the Kremlin to fake uh, another group uh, in the society because they realize it's there. Uh, and on your question about the smart voting, I think it's a cat mouse game. So the Kremlin comes up with a new repressive way, with a new sort of ways to fraud uh, the election. Uh, Navalny's team, at this point, I would say the most vibrant and the most talented uh, group of opposition activists and politicians in society, they come up with something else. So it's a matter of uh, us figuring out what's next uh, now that we see this new challenge as the electronic voting. It's going to be a serious challenge, uh, no questions asked. And on Europe, I think that the geopolitical positions of the Kremlin are driven primarily by the, the way it views the West as their fundamental challenge and foe, partly because the West will push the, uh, the Kremlin to towards more democracy and the Kremlin, all the Kremlin wants is to stay in power at whatever it takes. So from that perspective, fundamentally, despite, by the way, increasing demand for reinstalling, the reestablishing the good relationship with the West, in the society, if you look at the polls, Russians increasingly want good relationship with the West and get rid, get rid of the sanctions. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think it's going to influence the uh, behavior of the Kremlin fundamentally. Once again, because the Europe and the uh, United States are understood as uh, pushing the Kremlin into towards more democracy, which the Kremlin is not uh, likely to accept anytime soon. Okay, thank you, Maria. Uh, we have a question from um, Ambassador Bill Courtney. Um, Brian, if I ask you to answer this, to what extent might the 2020 Belarusian elections and the protests have influenced the Russian government's approach to the Duma elections? Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Court. That's a great question. I, I, I think they, they, they influenced it enormously. I mean, the, um, the, 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 the Putin did not want a repeat of what we saw in Belarus. Um, he certainly did not want that, and he did not want a repeat of 2021. Um, any popular uprising in any uh, any former Soviet state is is something that causes concern in, in the Kremlin, and certainly one in Belarus, which is one of two countries that Russia considers to be uh, you know, um, of its vital interest in terms of strategic depth, and that the other being, of course, Ukraine. So Russia is very sensitive always to what goes on in in Russia or Belarus. If I may, I also wanted to return to the question of smart voting, voting very, very briefly. Um, I mean, we, we have to think about what is smart voting for? What's the purpose of smart voting? And it's just a, it's a tactic to delegitimize the elections, just as the elections are, are legitimization rituals from the perspective of the Kremlin, from the perspective of the opposition, they are opportunities to delegitimize the regime. 
Um, and to the extent that smart voting works, it's a good tactic. And to the extent that it doesn't, it's 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 a tactic that needs to be to be modified. Um, it worked when the Kremlin was unprepared for it. It worked in 2011. It wasn't called smart voting then, but that's basically what Navalny told his supporters to do: vote for anybody but United Russia. Um, and it worked in 2011 to the extent that it kind of embarrassed the Kremlin's narrative um, about that election. But then we re remember the Duma that was elected by that. That Duma was a printing press for the for the Kremlin. That was the Duma that gave us the foreign agent law. That was the Duma that gave the Duma, Duma that gave us the undesirable organizations law. That was the Duma that gave us the so-called blasphemy law and all of this, a lot of this crazy legislation that was coming out of that Duma. So we have to wonder how how successful was that um, going forward? Um, now with the with the repression, with the pressure on tech companies, with the opportunities for falsification that that, that reside in elect electronic voting, I have to wonder if maybe this tactic has to be modified going forward and how we should approach Russian elections. Should we even continue to call them elections? Should our media, should, should, should Western media even continue to cover them elections, um, which, get, which, which confers on them a, de a degree of legitimacy, or should we kind of treat them the way we treated Soviet elections? Um, which were not elections at all, and which were not covered by the Western media or even broadly discussed um, you know, in, in forums like this. I'm not sure we want to go that far. But I think going forward, th since these things are legitimization rituals, I think it's it, what, what we need to be thinking, the question we need to be asking is, how do you delegitimize these things? Or how do you not at least not confer legitimacy upon them? Okay, Brian, thank you. Um, interesting points. We have a question from um, Dr. Harlan Ullman. And he says um, to me, you've asked about the legitimacy of Russian elections and asked, do you think Trump's big lie and the lack of legitimacy of US elections and implied played out and had any impact in connection with Russia? Um, I'm not sure I, I see how there'd be a connection, but um, um, Vlad, you're a historian besides a politician. Do you see any interplay here? Well, definitely in a sense uh, that, you know, the old Soviet propaganda uh, used to uh, sort of always when they would face criticism of human rights abuses uh, in the uh, Soviet Union from the West, they would also, they would always, you know, engage in this, what about, what about ism tactic? They'd say, well, what about lynchings in the US? What about this and that, you know, in that country and that? So in this sense, what happened in the last US election was an absolute gift for the Kremlin propaganda because, uh, now, when they're faced with these questions, uh, I should say, obviously, very obviously for everybody who's joining us in this conversation, in a completely false and manipulated way, but this is how they always do things. And so now when they face, uh, for example, you know, when they will start, uh, already today we saw a very strong statement from the European Union. I hope we hear something from the other side of the Atlantic as well in terms of the uh, essentially non-recognition of the results of this election as, as anything legitimate democratic. Uh, of course, the Kremlin will will and will no doubt hear this in the next few days on these state TV shows. Uh, that oh, who are they to talk? Look what happened in the in the American election when votes were falsified and, and so on. Uh, and so, in this sense, uh, the the question is absolutely right. It, it gave you know this this debacle that happened in the U.S. presidential election in 2020, and it played out all over the world, including, of course, prominently here and amplified here in Russian state TV programs. This will be used by the Kremlin. Uh, as a propaganda tool, much in the same way as they used to, you know, talk about lynchings and racism in the American South to respond, or, or I should say, to re to re deflect any criticism of domestic human rights uh, records. So in this sense, yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question from Miriam Lanskoy from NED. Um, she, Miriam asked, did any liberal candidate, for example, Mitrochin, um win? Um, the liberal, liberal candidates win? Um, Tatiana? I had to unmute. Uh, no, as far as I know, Mitrochin didn't win their the campaign. But uh, now I checked their this their the chat and I saw that uh, Boris Vishnevsky is going to win in to win in uh, Saint Petersburg, but not for the state Duma, but for the regional parliament. Okay, thank you. And by the way, if I if I may quickly add, John, to Please. this. So, uh, what's important to 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 what we were discussing? Yeah. And Miriam, thank you so much for this question. To what we're just discussing about electronic voting, Sergei Mitrokhin won massively, as I mentioned, by more than two times. He won in the actual paper ballot. So, in my polling station, it was 
35% for Michoacan against 14% for the pro Kremlin candidates. Overall, in the Central District of, of Moscow, it was a little closer, something like 30% to 20%, but he won, no question. And then the electronic votes came in, and they came in literally, actually, finally, during this event. Uh, I'm also checking with my other, you know, one of my eyes, I'm checking uh, the news on this. Just now, the official electronic voting results were announced, and officially, Mitrokhin lost by four percentage points to the, uh, the pro-regime candidate. Uh, I also mentioned that uh, Lev Schlossberg, another uh, strong, prominent leader of Yablako, somebody who came to national prominence uh, uh, opposing the so-called scoundrels law, when in 2012, uh, Putin passed a law forbidding um, adoptions by Russian or of Russian orphans by American citizens. He came to national prominence speaking out against that law. And also even more so in 2014, as one of the few Russian politicians, along with Boris Nemtsov and, and Vishnevsky, but not many others, to uh, publicly oppose the war in Ukraine and the annexation of Crimea. Schlossberg would have definitely won. Uh, he was running in uh, in Kovrinsky district, which is in northwest Moscow. As I mentioned, he was taken off the ballot uh, by the Supreme Court of Russia last week. Um, and then, of course, Vishnevsky, uh, as Tatiana just said, uh, he won not uh, the, you know, he was elected not to the national parliament, but he was re-elected to um, the St. Petersburg City Legislature, where he is currently a member. He is the deputy leader of Yablako nationally. And I have to say that uh, Boris Vishnevsky deserves special congratulations on, on, on his victory today or yesterday, because what the regime did, and this, I mean, this has already become the subject of jokes and memes and anecdotes, but, you know, what, what the authorities did in Vishnevsky's district is that they found two men, legally changed their names to Boris Vishnevsky, but they didn't stop there. They also photoshopped their images. So when people came to vote over the last three days in the central district in St. Petersburg, where he was running, you know, in every Russian polling station, you have a list of candidates for the photographs. So the people in that district, when they came in, you know, the first three names on that list of candidates, they saw three identical men, uh, you know, balding, gray beard, with the name Boris Vishnevsky. Um, this is what the authorities, you know, have to descend to. I mean, there were many other tricks. Uh, there were unlawful multiple voting drives organized in these districts. There were fake pictures of the so It looks like they have absolutely nothing on these. This is what they have to swim to. And so it gives me a special pleasure to, to say, uh, as Tatiana just did, that my good friend Boris Vishnevsky, despite all of this, despite everything that we are uh, discussing here today, has won re-election and will continue to remain a member of the St. Petersburg City Legislature, one of a handful uh, of genuine opposition uh, voices in Russian regional legislatures, even if we still have zero going forward in the national parliament. Okay, thank you. Um, Alessia Koenig um, has some a question, some an interesting observation. Um, the question is, how do you think voting abroad influenced the result of elections, especially in Moscow and St. Petersburg? And the information she provides is that at noon Eastern time, the, the Gususlugi site for voting was not available quote, due to too many voting requests, unquote. So, um, Tachan, if you want to take a shot at that. Uh, I'm not sure that I uh, have information about voting abroad. Honestly, yeah. I didn't, didn't check the results. Uh, and about Gosuslugi, it's the same. Uh, uh, Vladimir was talking a lot about it. Gosuslugi is the, uh, is the website, and you vote through this website electronically. So, um, uh, as far as I understand, uh, uh, they uh, they decided to vote in the beginning. So they they decided that it's better to put pressure on the people in the beginning and to tell them go and vote immediately. Don't wait for the Saturday. Don't wait for the Sunday. We don't know what will be next day. So please vote the first hour when we start. Please vote this first hour. So that's why Gosuslugi didn't work for their in the beginning in in Friday, and after it was working correctly. Uh, and uh, they working correctly, 
but they didn't count correctly. So, and after uh, people didn't face any problems voting, uh, voting on it. But uh, the, uh, also I want to add that we don't know, uh, did, did they even count this or not? Or they just uh, putting figures now on the papers? Fair enough, okay. It looks like our, our references to social media have produced a strong reaction in the audience. We have three questions. I'm going to read the three questions, and everybody will have a chance to comment on them. Um, from William Posner, is it possible that by caving into Kremlin demands, Google and Apple have preserved some semblance of internet access in Russia, preventing complete isolation? Could they have called the Kremlin's bluff? For example, if they were completely forbidden from working in Russia, would the Kremlin risk domestic pushback? So that's one. Two, from Dan Free. Um, he notes that the two sites have, the two social media have received criticism for the agreement to pull the smart voting app. And he says this may be an opportunity. This may be an opportunity for uh, a code of conduct. And what do people think in the panel, what that code of conduct might include? Then we have, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I've missed the plural. Oh, there it is. Brad Shen questions our focus on this. And says, is this is it the right or the excuse me, it's the duty of, of these companies to deal with the problems of Russia's political system? Um, and may, might those of us who are arguing this was a bad idea for these companies to, to take this measure, are we in effect advocating they break laws that we disagree with? So three points of view, two rather similar, one not. And so Miriam, you have the first crack, please, one and a half minutes max. I mean, Maria, Maria. That's fine, I'll go with Miriam. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, that's an excellent point. And I'm grateful, uh, John, for you uh, for bringing it up because I think that's something that's really possible to do in the United States. Uh, so first of all, uh, breaking the laws, that's a little bit, a little bit of a, a fine statement, I believe, since uh, what sort of laws are we talking about? The, so the, the laws that the legitimate dictatorship establishes. And then I'm sorry, how do you define uh, that we can go very far down that, uh, that uh, road? And the US has already has this history Maria, I think, Vladimir. Maria, I think you're right. I think it's probably more of a fiat rather than a, a law in Russia. Yeah, absolutely. And plus, the US has the history of establishing a sanctioning, sanctions policy for the violations, for example, of human rights outside of the US territory, right? So it's not completely unprecedented for punishing certain actors for engaging uh, in certain types of behavior, even if that technically outside uh, is the sort of behavior is outside of the US. Uh, uh, territorial borders, uh, so to speak. So that is, again, not it's entirely new and unprecedented. By the way, the sanctions policy has become inclusively pronounced in the US uh, foreign policy making in the recent years. Uh, second of all, I'm really grateful for, to Dan Fried for suggesting the code of conduct. Here, I think a separate panel or discussion will be needed to among the um, experts. Uh, but I think something along the lines that some kind of conduct uh, should be established for uh, tech companies that would limit the ability to uh, give in to the pressure from their authoritarian uh, countries. Um, uh, yes, unfortunately, it would mean that some it will hurt a little bit their business interests. And finally, I think the question that I'm more in the position to answer about the possible backlash uh, from uh, the Russian society, if the, the, uh, the Russian government was to, uh, say, ban Google entirely uh, in Russia or Apple. I think, yes, uh, currently one of the problems with the results, uh, we see the fraud is obvious, as Vladimir, for example, has pointed it out. Uh, but there's no protest. Most likely we will not witness major mobilization of the Russian uh, society because everybody's horrified. Uh, the repressive wave was very impressive. And there's also COVID related um, rulings that ban mass gatherings in the country. Uh, but uh, plus a lot of people kind of feel still very alienated from the politics. Uh, but the situation with the internet is very different. A lot of people in Russia really feel very dependent on uh, internet. Um, Google, iPhones are a very big thing in Moscow. If you take a look, everybody has iPhones. So from that perspective, that's something that may really hurt uh, a lot of Russians and feel that their direct interests have been uh, meddled with. So from that perspective, it actually may uh, create some backlash. And I think that's one of the reasons why until now the Kremlin was very careful uh, dealing with the tech, right? They push some kind of legislation on the tech companies, but they do not ban or outlaw those companies entirely from the country. Thank you. Okay, Brian, please, one minute or less. Uh, but please unmute so we can hear you. <laughs> uh, thank you, John. Um, 
Yeah, this, I mean, this question points to a larger philosophical question almost. I mean, the problem of a normative conflict, um, and this is what we are in with Russia, the West is in a normative conflict with Russia in an age of globalization. So on one hand, we have these US companies that were formed in you know, a country where you have the rule of law, and they're forced to operate in, 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 in Russia by basically Soviet rules in an environment where there isn't the rule of law. And until we figure out how to handle that larger philosophical problem, uh, we, we, you know, we, we enter this post-Soviet period assuming that our law, rule of law system is what is going to spread around the world. And now we see the anti-rule of law system that we see operating in, in, in the Russian Federation affecting Western companies. I agree with Ambassador Freed. I'd like to see a, a, a you know, common, st uh, common standards and a code of conduct. Of conduct. I mean, the, the Apple and Google have standards for their apps and what can and cannot go on their app store or what kind of content can and cannot be posted here in the US and in Western Europe and in countries where you do have the rule of law. And I, I think that standard should apply across the board. Um, but but uh, that's not how it works in reality because these companies want access to the very big Russian market. And we have a similar problem going on in China where they want access to the very big and very lucrative Chinese market. Um, and again, we have some hard choices to make as a society right now about this. Um, because as long as our companies are operating in these non-rule of law environments and are forced to comply with these, these fiats, um, as you put it, John, uh, we're not gonna be able to solve this problem. We have some very difficult choices to make about this. During the Cold War, you couldn't even sell some the functional equivalent of iPhones. There weren't iPhones then, but the functional equivalent, you couldn't sell that kind of tech to the Soviet Union because of COCOM export restrictions, right? And when we're, we are, we're wondering now if we're, if we're gonna end up moving in that direction, although I think Silicon Valley would scream bloody murder about that because they don't wanna lose those markets. So we have to decide what's more important, democracy or money? Or national security or money? Or national security, exactly. Okay, uh, Tatiana, please, one minute or less. And unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you for the discussion. It was uh, it was really very difficult summer uh, for me and for for our team because uh, uh, on the thirty first of May, Andrei was arrested, and uh, we spent all this time trying to uh, to talk about his case and uh, trying to explain that we have political prisoners now in Russia. And I think it's very important uh, for everybody to understand that, that uh, it's, it's a huge possibility to, um, to be in jail, even if you want uh, to, to be elected, not for, uh, not for even going to the street or, uh, talking about uh, stuff like this with people, but only if you want to be elected as uh, absolutely um, legally. And, uh, you know, we had uh, a case this, uh, this spring that when uh, uh, almost 200 uh, municipal deputies in Moscow was arrested for taking part in their uh, educational event. So I hope that it's not the, the future of our country that uh, uh, this situation uh, will be changed, but for the moment, it's very tough to be involved in the political life here. Thank you. Okay, um, Vlad, I'm told we were just about ready to shut down. One minute, final comment. Thanks, John. Very quickly, to be honest, I'm a little bit puzzled by the comment about the need to follow laws. I mean, there was once a law in Germany that Jews were not allowed to go into cafes and shops. I mean, are these the kind of laws that companies should follow? No, no I mean, it's, but, but uh, uh, as, as Maria said, we can go uh, really far along that road if we want to follow that flawed and, and to my, in my view, deeply immoral logic. Uh, but I'm, I'm glad we're discussing the question of Western complicity because, uh, you know, when, when I'm involved in discussions about, for example, Magnitsky laws, Magnitsky sanctions in the West, it's not only about the human rights abusers, who want to enjoy the hospitality of Western countries and also the Western enablers who make this situation possible. And I'm really glad that we have discussed uh, quite a lot in this conversation today, the fact that those Western tech companies are, basing, uh, are basically, uh, in this case, enabling and abetting Putin's political censorship. And yes, I think perhaps you know, through a code of conduct, as Ambassador Fried is suggesting, or perhaps through rigorous oversight or legislative changes, but I think it is time 
for Western policymakers, for Western elected officials to address this problem of companies in democratic nations enabling and abetting repressive dictatorships against people of other countries. This is shameful, this is unacceptable, and it should be stopped. Very strong words. Thank you for that. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we are way out way over time, and we'll be doing more on this subject going forward.